Hello, we're reading Bell Tarpoon by Darby Karshut, and today we're reading Chapter 10. We lost the race with the storm. Splashing into the yard, I spotted Kathleen leaning over the porch rail, waving her cell phone. Already chilled from my so sodden shirt and jeans, I tensed. Uh-oh. Izzy blew her dripping forelock from her eyes. Something's wrong. Roman, we've got a roll, Kathleen called. Joe just texted. The Morgan is in labor and having complications. Her voice trailed off. Looks like you guys saw some action. I'll fetch my bag. She met us in the barn. Who's first? I just got some scrapes. I spoke up quickly. But Turks got bit. I hit a grin at my cope. Then I'll start with him. She waited until Roman and I dismounted, then ran her hand over the black's right side. Hmm. Looks like a puncture, all right. She bent closer, fingers wiping away, the, away Skinner's, Skinner mu in mud and peered more closely in the dim light. It's nothing, Turk shifted away. You said the Morgan, Morrigan is in danger? I blinked in surprise at the note of worry in the stallion's voice until I remembered that the black mare named after the Celtic god of war was his dam. Kathleen hesitated for a moment. Not in danger, Percy. Pouring us a drop or two of Skinner venom isn't going to bother me. Yes, go, Kathleen. We'll be fine. Dad loosened, loosed Elsid's cinch as he spoke. At least you will make better time with an empty trailer. What about Matt? She had me. He's a mess. Maybe I should examine him before I leave, just in case. I'm fine, really. I held up a battered elbow. See? Nothing more serious than this. Get tough or go home. I reminded myself. Show them that I can take it. I disregarded the lingering pain. It was becoming numb anyway. Well, if you're sure, we are. Dad nudged her toward the door. Now go. The mayor needs you more than we do. And you know how Vasco gets at times like this. We need to hurry before you have two patients to worry about. Roman took her arm. A few minutes later, they drove out of the yard, the empty trailer dancing behind them. Working in silence, we took care of the war horses. Dad switched mounts with me. Guess he figured Turk and I have had enough of each other. Elsa dozed while I claimed him. Good. He needed rest. I took a calming breath. There was something about being inside the barn while it rained. Storms and mo storms and monsters outside. My family warm and safe inside. I breathed in the smell of straw and horse and rain washed prairie, trying to dissolve the leftovers of jitters. My head had other ideas. The same two questions kept tumbling around in my skull. How are we going to get to the cave with all those skinners running around? And how are we going to stop more from escaping? After serving El Cid a late lunch, I steeled I steeled myself and walked up to the Turk. I, um, I want to say something. He raised his head, just grinding in the slight sight to side motion. A few grains of oat dribbled out of the corner of his mouth. Well, thanks. Thanks. For what? For earlier in the maze, I said. Thought those Skinners had me. I didn't do it for you. He, choose, he chewed some more, then swallowed. Now go away so I can eat in peace. Sheesh, family. Slogging through the puddles, I missed the warmth of the barn. Every bruise and cut made a point of reacquaintance them. Made a point of reacquainting themselves with my nerves. I plodded up the porch steps. My legs grew heavy with each step. As if the boots as if my boots were filled with concrete, then my vision blurred. I leaned against the railing for a moment, panting as I waited for the odd dizziness to go away. Had I hit my head when I fell? Feeling only a little better, I sucked in a shaky breath and opened the screen door. Its squeal announced my arrival. Remove your boots, Dad ordered from the kitchen, and come here. I towed them off, left left them by the door next to his and Ben's, and padded into the kitchen. My father stood by the sink, rummaging through the first aid kit, and held up a familiar dark, dark brown bottle, and then, then has put his reading glasses and checked the date. Bueno, he grunted. Still effective. I grimaced. Oh man, I hate that stuff. Can't you use medication from this century? Nothing works like good old fashioned iodone. Iodone? Nothing burns like good old fashioned iodone. I gritted my teeth through the treatment of each elbow. You didn't do this to Turk. I flapped my arms and s 
arm to soothe the stinging. He is larger than me. Dad motioned for me to turn around, then lifted my shirt on my shoulder blades. Cold air wafted across my bare skin. I shivered, wondering why it felt so chilly in the house. It must be my wet clothes. Another wave of Disney this mingled with nausea swept over me. A clammy sweat broke out on my face and torso. Can we do this later? I don't feel so good. A long silence. What's taking so long? Dad, can you hurry up, please? How close did those Skinners get to you? You mean, besides the one who slammed me into the ground and rolled around on top of me trying to chew off my face? I joked weakly. Another long silence. I was starting to hate them. Plus, I really wanted to sit down. And he touched the spot of my lower back. A white hot pain flared. Ow! I flinched away. Warn me next time. Matt. He gripped my arm, holding me still. You have a bite wound. Hannah squeezed its fist around my throat. I opened and closed my mouth. Nothing came out. I licked my lips and tried again. H how bad? One. Not too deep, but he didn't need to finish the sentence. I already knew. I knew already. Depth didn't matter. It was how much venom got into my body. I gotta sit down. On wobbly legs, I groped for a chair. My knees folded. He caught me before I hit the linen lineum, then swept me up in his arms, ho hoisting me higher. He hurried out of the kitchen and across the living room. I swallowed, fighting the queasiness that worried, worsened er with every stride. Dad, you'll be all right, my son. Ben appeared. What happened? Eyes wide, he stepped aside as her father brushed past. What's wrong with Matt? Skinner got him. Dad carried me to my bedroom. The small room felt airless and dark. Too dark. Had the storm gotten inside our house? Somehow? I tried to warn Dad and Ben, but my tongue was fat. It was a fat, lazy worm. Quickly, Ben. I need you, too. The rest of the word, words faded away. Pain knifed me again. The agony spread in waves throughout the rest of my body. My jaw tingled, telling me I was seconds away from throwing up. Then everything was a blur. Vomiting, shaking with fever, my body curled up in a ball from cramps, hands moving me when all I wanted to do was sleep, Ben's voice breaking as he spoke, my father forcing some nasty-tasting stuff between my lips. I choked on the water that followed up, spilling it down my chin. Then, nothing. I left for a while. Don't know where, where I went, just floated around in the darkness. No feeling, no sight, no sound, except I thought I was caught in a low murmur. Just on the edge of my hearing. Was it Dad? Or Ben? Whoever they were, they whispered the same words over and over. Hail Mary, full of grace. With a jerk, I was conscious. Where was I? I peeked through a still, silted eyelid. Wherever I was, it wasn't as dark. The amber glow of the bedside lamp welcomed me back, as did the familiar weight of my old quilt. For a few moments, I lay there, afraid to move in case the pain was waiting in ambush. I never wanted to hurt that badly again. Couldn't imagine, and hoped like heck I ever wouldn't. I ever would. That low murmuring from earlier. I peeled. I peeled the other eye open. My father was seated on the edge of the mattress, head bowed and elbows propped on his knees. A rosy, a raw rosary dangled from his fingers. I squinted past him. Ben lay spread eagled on the. Spread eagle on the other twin bed, his face slack with sleep. Dad? I mouthed the word, but nothing came out. I worked my tongue and tried again. Dad? He raised his head. His eyes were red-rimmed with exhaustion, and he had the same shirt he'd worn on the hunt. Sure smelled like it. Placing the beads on on the nightstand, he leaned over me. How are you feeling, me, Miho? He said in a soft voice. Like Turk won a couple of rounds on me. I managed to grin. He didn't, did he? Not this time. A faint smile lit up my face, lit up his face. He cupped my cheek. His fingers caught, callous but gentle. Do not frighten your old man like that again, okay? Not planning on it. Thirsty? At my nod, he picked up a drinking glass from the table and held the straw to my lips. Slowly. Make sure it stays down. The water washed away the sour taste of vomit. After a few pulls, I sighed and glanced at the darkened window. What time is it? Around four. In the morning? You've been here all this time? All night. Ben sat up, his hair flattened at, on one side. We weren't running to the barn to check on the jerk. Between the two of you, the time timing stunk. Turk okay? He's fine. Dad rose, straightening his back on. Back one vertebrae at a time. Crack, crack, crack. Except for lying about how badly he was bitten. If he... 
pulls an axe like that again, I will kill him. You'd have to get in line, Ben yawn, yawned, behind El Cid. He rolled off the bed and staggered to the doorway. I'll go check on the horses. And start some coffee, por favor, Dad called after him. He turned to me. Are you hungry? Some toast and tea? Toast and tea, tea sounded pretty good. And bacon? Let us see how your stomach handles toast first. I managed a few sip, sips of tea and half a slice of dry toast. Even that wore me out. I woke up a few hours later, rubbing my face. I grimaced at the feel of dry sweat and crusty flakes of it. I didn't want to know of what. And crusty flakes of I didn't want to know of what. Morning sun outlined the lower blinds. The other bed was empty. Across the hall, I caught the hiss of the shower. Great. There goes all the hot water. I lay there for a while, walking my fingers around the familiar pattern of my kilt. Quilt. Our great aunt Dor Dorius had sewn matching ones for me and Ben when we were little. Dad always said she was destined for sainthood because she had given us had given up a comfortable retirement in Arizona to come live with us after Mom died. She stayed until we were old enough not to burn down the house whenever Dad and Elsa had hunted. Pushing the covers to one side, I eased off the mattress and took stock, sore in places, especially in my back, but ignorable. I pulled on sweatpants and a clean t-shirt, then shuffled out with the living room, my knees trying to remember how to walk. With every step, I felt stronger. Dressed in clean clothes and hair, still damp from a shower, Dad laid stretched out on the sofa, eyes shut and hands clasped behind his head. Better? Yeah, moving around helps. If you would, he said, eyes still closed. Show your face, El Cid. He's been threatening to crash the front door. I stepped outside. The thick scent of rain washed sage in damp earth filled my nose and mouse mouth. Across the yard, Izzy lofted in the shade of the barn. She tossed her head in greeting, then called over her shoulder. Hey, El Cid, guess who's up? And walking around on two legs. I'll give you a hint. It's not Turk. El Cid burst out of the barn at a fast trot, nostrils tight with worry. I thought for a moment he'd come up the porch steps. Matt? I'm okay. I walked down the wooden treads, warm, under my bare feet, and wrapped my arms around his neck. Really? I don't know which one of us was more alarmed. Me or your father. Please don't get bit again. All right. Already promised Dad. Looking past him, I noticed Turk limping out of the barn, his movements slow and stiff, standing broadside to the sun. He lowered his head, his head and closed his eyes. Something tugged at my heart. You too. Me too. What? Elsa asked. Promise me that you will never ever get bit. Either. Silly boy. He chuffed, then curved his neck and pressed me to his chest. That's the end of chapter 10. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions or comments, please throw them in the comments. Uh, if you liked, please like the video and subscribe. Thanks. Bye.